Welcome to the Center for Investment Excellence, a production of J.P. Morgan Asset Management. The Center for Investment Excellence is a podcast that provides educational insights across asset classes and investment themes. I'm David Lebowitz, global strategist in our multi-asset solutions business and host of the Center for Investment Excellence. With me today is Stephen Squinto, the Chief Investment Officer of J.P. Morgan Life Sciences Private Capital. Welcome to the Center for Investment Excellence, Steve. Thank you. Well, we are uh, we are excited to uh, to have you here today. Um, obviously, we're going to be focusing in on on biotech and what's happening in in that space uh, specifically. But I think you know, we're having this conversation at a really interesting time, where when you think about what private markets have been through over the past couple of years, you know, twenty twenty two, you saw rates moving aggressively higher. That kind of put everything on ice. Uh, obviously, real estate has its own set of problems. You now look at the private equity industry, you look at the venture capital industry, and you know, some parts seem to be thawing, but, but other parts you know, not seeing the, the, the volume of activity that I think people would have expected at this point, particularly given what we've seen in the public markets. Yet, when we take a step back and think about building portfolios for the long run, we continue to view alternatives as really being an essential allocation rather than an optional one. And whether you're going to alternatives for diversified sources of income, additional diversification in your portfolio, or simply the return enhancement yep. that venture capital and private equity can provide, you know, the stocks and bonds in and of themselves are two great tools. But I think that that broader opportunity set is going to remain very relevant uh, going forward. And so you know, diving in and, and thinking a little bit about what's happening in your space specifically, it's been somewhat of a challenging fundraising environment in aggregate so far this year for, for private markets broadly. But can you talk to us a little bit about what's been going on in the biotech space specifically, and furthermore, how you see that translating into deal activity? Yeah. So I, I think where I'd start is biotech was at its peak January, February 2020, just as the p- pandemic was arriving, right? Money was flowing into funds. Money was flowing into privately held companies, venture-backed companies. There was this exuberant sort of feel about where biotech is going to take. It was going to solve the problems of the world, you know, COVID, so forth and so on. I think what happened, too many companies got capitalized. Too many funds were raised. Mm -hmm. Investors' expectations were sky high. You know, where's the next Moderna going to come from, right? Companies then went public perhaps a bit too early without the right management team, the right game plan, the right strategy. Clinical expectations were not met, and the house of cards came tumbling down. Here we are in 2024. So raising money has been a challenge, although when you look at the $50 billion that was raised by the healthcare venture industry in 2023, that's not very far off from 2022, mm-hmm. right? But pretty far off from 2020, 2021. Yep. So it has been challenging. And I would say the, the bulk of the raise has largely been done by very mature companies, uh, mm-hmm. investing companies who have a history of raising funds, three, four, five funds. Mm-hmm. They can look to their performance. They can say, hey, you know, we're still doing a good job. If you're a first time fund, as we were <laughs> going out a year ago, uh, it was pretty brutal. Yeah. And I remember meeting uh, a prospective investor in the Middle East who had been investing in biotech since its inception, you know, mm-hmm. 35, 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. And he looked at me and said, this is the toughest I've seen since I've been investing in this industry for the past 35, 40 years, if you're a first-time fund. Right. So glad that we kind of were able to get ours done. But uh, it's been tough out there, absolutely tough. And so, you know, c- congratulations, right? Thank you. <laughs> a little, little, little bit of that is obviously deserved. So, um, you know, having gone through the the fundraising period, what are you seeing in terms of the market today? You know, would love to get your perspective on you know where there are deals being done, the types of deals being done, how you're making sense of valuations in light of those deals, and yeah. particularly around exits, because that's where traditional private equity has really gotten gotten kind of okay, stuck. So that's a lot in that question, but yes. let's let's pull it apart. Yeah. So so let's start with valuation. 
valuations, right? Um, it's it, it it's a buyer's market, right? I mean, valuations have come way down. Biotech, we follow the XBI index mm-hmm. uh, from its peak in early 20, 2020. It's down 60, 70 percent. So public markets were hit hardest. Mm-hmm. That has filtered into the private marketplace. Yep. So we are seeing value in deals unlike we've seen in a long time. So that's great for the investor, a little tougher on the company's CEO. Mm -hmm. Deals are getting done. Money is being deployed. But I think we have the opportunity as investors today to be much more selective. Mm -hmm. You know, when my partners and I got together here at J.P. Morgan a year and a half ago, we set down for ourselves, you know, a series of six, seven investment principles, right? Right. This has got to be a company with really innovative technology. This is not a me too product that's being developed. Mm -hmm. It's got to move the healthcare needle, Mm -hmm. right? It's this company that's got to be following the science, all the clues that one can get from genetic information, biochemical information. They've got to be following it. They've got to be able to pivot when things don't go so well. That speaks to team quality. Mm -hmm. You know, 100% will invest in people over product. Right, because good people are going to figure out a way to get through all the walls that are going to come up as these products move through this difficult dilemma that we call drug development. Yep. So deals are getting done. Companies are staying private longer. That's kind of an interesting thing to think about. So mm-hmm. there, there, there's a need for more capital because um, I think in part your question was the exit strategy, right? You know, the IPO market is not so great right now. It really dried up for a while. There have been a few IPOs in the biotech space over the last couple of months, Mm -hmm. one just the other day. I think that's starting to change a bit. But what's been really interesting to watch is M&A activity. Mm -hmm. We are going to hit, I think 2024 is going to hit a record. The record for M&A was 2021. Mm-hmm. We're halfway through the year. We're, we're north of $100 billion in M&A activity already. And there are several reasons driving that that we can speak to, if you'd like, as well. Yeah, I think you know, drilling down a little bit further, I'd love to hear what you think is is driving and pushing that M&A activity to be so robust. Uh, and then I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the themes and opportunities. But let's finish the deal side of things first. Yeah, let's, let's talk about M&A. So... In 2022-2023, investors were just flat out feeling burnt. Yeah. I went into biotech. I had expectations that were here. These companies have failed. You know, maybe they went public. The IPO price from, is now down, whatever it is, 30, 40, 50 percent. Yep. Why am I investing, right? Mm-hmm. Since we started raising our first fund, I've seen that mood shift a lot. People have become aware of maybe three or four things. One, they're starting to appreciate we are at a moment in time on the techno- technological side and science side unlike we've ever seen. Yeah. It's 40 years of understanding biological processes. It's 20 years of genetic information that has now been you know, re- resolved, right? Mm-hmm. The computing power that we now have. Right. The ability to make things smaller and better, nanotechnology, mm-hmm. it's all, co- and now you layer on top of that generative AI. Yeah. People are starting to realize we're at a time where we're going to start seeing cures for diseases, unlike we've seen before. So better get in now. Valuations have way, come way down. This is an opportune time. And then you have the patent cliff issue for pharma. Right. So there, depending on who you read and, 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 and who you want to believe, I've heard in the neighborhood of maybe $300 billion wow. in lost revenues if you look at the top 25, 30 selling drugs on the market today. Mm-hmm. You know, that's incredible. Pharma has evolved into organizations that are phenomenal at sales and marketing. They've kind of given up on R&D yeah. because they know that there's biotech companies out there that can do it better, faster, more efficiently, and less capital intense. So... They've got capital to deploy to buy those companies Mm -hmm. to fill that gap, that revenue gap. And we're seeing just so much of that in our space now. Um, I mean, it will be, I think, a record-breaking year for M&A activity in biotech. Yeah, well, I, think, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, and particularly your point around the, the patents and the lack of investment in R&D, you know, it sounds like they're much more comfortable going out and kind of finding a product yeah. that's already been proven. Yeah, why build it if you can buy it exactly. and you've got the capital to buy it? 
Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, sticking with that theme of, you know, you mentioned that the toolkit is so much better. We have more data. We have more history, more experience. Um, what are some of the themes that you're seeing in the market today? Where are you identifying opportunities? You mentioned that, you know, we could be on the cusp of curing diseases that, you know, 10 years ago, people didn't even consider that in the realm of possibility. So where are those opportunities? So when I, when I first started at J.P. Morgan, I had dinner. I'm not going to name names. So I had a dinner with one of my very good friends, former colleague of mine, uh, at one of the largest biotech companies in the world. Yep. So no names. <laughs> and he said to me over that dinner, if I were you, I would take your entire fund and put it into obesity. So y- you have to talk about obesity, right? Yep. It, it is... I don't know if, if you have seen some of the projections. We have we have we have a duopathy right now. We have Lilly and Novo Nordisk that are controlling the obesity marketplace with these GLP-1 drugs, right? Yep. I think every buy side and actually every sell side analyst I've read are calling these 150 billion dollar annual revenue products. Yep. Ozempic, Manjaro, Wagovi, right? Three. This is not going to remain a dualopathy. I, mm-hmm. I, I, no one believes this. Well, I shouldn't say no one, but we certainly don't believe that. There is going to be plenty of room for better follow-on products. Mm-hmm. You know, but think about $150 billion in revenue. Pharma has never seen an opportunity like this. Right. So every large pharma now is talking about how they're going to play the game. And they're going to look for biotech companies developing mm-hmm. innovative products in this space. So incredible drugs. They're injectable, as we all know, that, that you know, you have to have a pen. Mm-hmm. There's supply chain, supply chain issues with these pens right now. Yep. Um, they have to be cold stored mm-hmm. for, for best efficacy. And it's going to meet a certain market demand. But if you believe the World Health Organization that there are a billion obese people on planet Earth, mm-hmm. and if you count, um, you know, those that are overweight, mm-hmm maybe not officially obese, that's another billion. That's yep. two billion people that could be served yep. by a weight loss product. These drugs work, you will lose 15, 20% of your body mass, but about 40 to 50% of it is gonna come with a loss of muscle versus fat. So we're all in. Mm-hmm. We're, we're looking at opportunities you know, every day in this space for better versions of GLP, but also other targets that we think are going to be really interesting. I could see a multitude of products being, you know, competitive in, in, in this space. So if you're a venture investor in life sciences, you almost have to be in this space. So that's number one for us. Yep. But it's not the only space. Mm-hmm. We're really excited about what we're seeing in autoimmune disease therapies, right? Mm-hmm. What's interesting is autoimmune disease is kind of leveraging off of what we've learned about checkpoint inhibition in cancer, Mm -hmm. you know, as a way of turning on the immune system to tackle tumor growth. Yep. So autoimmune disease companies are thinking, you know, what if we reverse that? Mm -hmm. And so we downregulate the immune system to a particular tissue. That could be an effective strategy for autoimmune disease. We're seeing a number of opportunities emerging there and are making investments in that space as well. You know, with all the hype around Ozempic and Manjaro, what was lost in the press was that there were two drugs approved by the FDA last year that for the first time are slowing the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. That's probably not as sexy as weight loss, but it's pretty important actually. So so we're going to learn from those drugs about mechanistically what is really going on with diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's. Mm -hmm. So I think there's going to be a new wave of treatments for neurodegenerative disease. We're excited about that field. Mental health. Mm-hmm. We're in a crisis situation, particularly post-COVID. Yep. There is a, desi- a desire and a, and a dire need for better medications to treat depression, schizophrenia, and other forms of mental health. So we're, we're interested in that, that space as well. And then I think what is really interesting, you know, everybody sort of has heard about CRISPR, Cas9, to mm-hmm. edit the human genome. We're looking at newer modalities today to more effectively and maybe more safely edit the human genome to get to what I said earlier, really correcting diseases and actually developing cures versus treatments. So that's an area we're pursuing as well. Well, those all sound pretty, pretty interesting and certainly uh, leading edge given, to your point, a lot of the challenges that that we're all facing in in a post-pandemic world. So I want to conclude with a question which is a little bit more 
operational, a little bit more tied to, to yep. the investing. And you made a comment earlier when you were talking about you know successful businesses, and you mentioned people. Yeah. You know, when you when you're looking at these biotech firms, obviously the science matters, obviously the product matters, but how do you think about evaluating? these businesses holistically? What do you look for? What are the characteristics? So of I'm going to use, if I can, really quickly two examples. Please. Yeah. So I, I was an early company builder at Regeneron, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to use a one company name. And then I was the co-founder uh, at Alexion. Yep. What I, what I, when I'm asked this question, I often answer it. The first six to seven people you hire if you're building a new biotech company are going to matter tremendously. Mm -hmm. These are folks that got to have vision. They've got to be resilient. They've got to be hungry for success. They've got to be able to pivot at a moment's notice if the science takes them in a different direction. The reason I say this is both companies had very early failures. Mm -hmm. you know, both companies took a while to be the success that they were. Yep. Those six to seven people were there a long time. Yep. And they helped create the personality, the culture, the let's get it done. We know we've got issues. We know we've got walls in front of us. We're going to find a way under them, around them, through them, over them, mm -hmm. whatever it's going to take. And if the science moves us in a different direction, we're not going to be afraid to make that pivot. Yep. And I think that's why I will always invest in people over over products. Awesome. Well, Steve, this was a, a lot of fun, a very informative conversation, and I'm sure everybody who's listening is, is enjoying it as well. So uh, thank you again for joining us on the Center for Investment Excellence, and we'll definitely have you back uh, sometime soon. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us today on J.P. Morgan Center for Investment Excellence. If you found our insights useful, you can find more episodes anywhere you listen to podcasts, on our website, and on our J.P. Morgan Asset Management YouTube channel. Recorded on June 11th, 2024. This content is intended for information only based on assumptions in current market conditions and are subject to change. No warranty of accuracy is given. This content does not contain sufficient information to support investment decisions. It is not to be construed as research, legal, regulatory, tax, accounting, or investment advice. Investments involve risks. Investors should seek professional advice or make an independent evaluation before investing. The value of investments and the income from them may fluctuate including loss of capital. Past performance and yield are not indicative of current or future results. Forecasts and estimates may or may not come to pass. J.P. Morgan Asset Management is the asset management business of J.P. Morgan Chase & Company and its affiliates worldwide.